Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I don't like to say this, but I find the state of organized labor, much like the state of American politics, very discouraging. I've asked Ed Ott, a distinguished lecturer in labor studies at the Murphy Institute and a veteran of the labor movement, to come today because I'd like to know what he thinks. And he's my guest today, and welcome. Oh, it's nice to be here again. So is that wrong to be discouraged? Well, I think, look, I, I've always teach my own students that we shouldn't be neither optimistic or pessimistic. If you look at the history of the labor movement, we have always kind of trailed behind changes in the economy, changes in how capital is organized, if you will. Uh, we've only been fully legal for, you know, 75 years. Uh, prior to that, we were really a mess and represented very few workers officially. Mm. Uh, there's no doubt the union's taken big hits over the last four decades. Uh, workers have suffered as a result of it. We've had this downward pressure on wages really now for 40 years. Uh, but uh, I think if you look at w the, the whole working class, there's a lot of organizing going on. The unions are, at least at this point, engaged in a discussion with elements of the working class. They kind of never developed a relationship when they were doing well. Uh, and now they're trying to figure out where do we go from here. Well, you know, the different, I, I agree with you, and uh, that was going to be my next question. But you don't miss, don't mix up optimist, uh, discouraged and pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic. But what I think is it needs to change. I mean, I, I well, think politics is going to get better. It proves also. you're not crazy. Yeah, you're right. It needs yeah. to change. And, yeah. you know, the, the thing that I think, we, we don't get about unions is unions a primary relationship with their members is to protect what they have so we get into one of these periods That's a we get into one of these periods where everything is changing uh, and the instinct of the union member hears the word new and they say new probably doesn't include me that's the experience of my lifetime they look to their unions to stop the new from intervening and I think at this period uh, it's demonstrated we've gone into a really different level of global economy and a global capitalism, if you will, that's very powerful, very aggressive. They harbor no organization that stands in their way. So the combination of total change, our own traditions, uh, and this really aggressive view of this new capital uh, has hurt us badly. But we're adjusting. It's, a, it's interesting because when you say the the worker will say something new, I don't want it. Uh, because those union members who've been there for a long time are making more money than anybody at their level outside. It's partially So that. that's understandable. I'm, but uh, also at the same time, the world, as you said, the world is changing, but it's also changing at the bottom. I mean, we never heard so much discussion of the disparity of income, right? Right. Well, we're and not we, in our lifetime. Yeah, in our lifetime. Right. And, and the local organizing, as you said, that's very exciting. So we got to bring the unions and them together. Is well, that what the object? Look, we, we've gone through this period where once they start reorganizing, particularly at the end of the Cold War, yeah. they redo the economy worldwide. So people start moving around, migrating, looking for a better life. They, you know, the Chinese go everywhere. The Vietnamese go to China. Um, Eastern Europe goes west. The South comes north. People all over the world are looking to figure out this new economy and where they fit in, how they're going to feed themselves. So I think we're in a period where new organizations need to be built. We had 15 million workers that have come to this country as immigrants in recent times. Uh, this is not 150 guys hiding out in El Paso. This is a phenomenon. This is not something that's happening to us here in America. We're not victims here. No. This is the new economy. Right. This is the new world. We're going to have to build organizations that can navigate their way through it. But we're dependent also on the politics because we've never had such a, in our lifetime, such a concentrated uh, group of, of rich people. <laughs> I mean, when the union was at its peak, uh, that was when the world was evener, wasn't it, with, with income? Because I think where workers are organized into unions in, in any economy, yeah. uh, that disparity between the top and the bottom is diminished. Uh, so, yes, right. I think it is reflective of a certain political disarmament that's taken place and a, and a defeat yeah. for, for working people. It's an, it's, so it means that the politics also has to reform. I mean, 
these next state elections. I mean, well, how are we ever going to take the money away from the top? Even it's not even the one percent. It's even a smaller percentage of the one percent, isn't it? Well, That's look, when, concentrated we, when, wealth? when we were younger, we learned that there were once people we referred to as robber barons, and people found that concentration of wealth intolerable, and they developed a politic and a reform to change it. Um, it probably helped that czars were getting their heads lopped off in Europe and it made other people think maybe we should find a middle ground here. Uh, that's lacking. There's not an effective left. There's not an effective alternative vision to capital development that people accept. Uh, so we're gonna, it's going to be a number of years. I mean, I don't think we get out of this uh, in the next election, no matter who we elect. It's going to take time. The basic question before the House is, what kind of society do you want to live yeah, in? Yeah, right. And people are going to have to stand up for themselves. And we're, and we're facing a, right. a major challenge to adjust. Right. If you look at it, right, tens of thousands of fast food workers, retail workers all across the country are beginning to stand up. Mm -hmm. Be coming down and saying, okay, when I was 21 years old and I was working for $8 an hour or less, I figured this was temporary. Now I'm in my mid-30s and it's kind of dawned on me. This is my lot. I'm not going to improve it by waiting for McDonald's to make me a district manager and pay me nine sixty an hour. I got to figure something else out. And I think you're beginning to see the forms of organizations being created. Now, immigrants have been making this battle for 25 years in this city. Uh, a, a combination of on-the-job fights with employers to make sure people get paid at all, get paid fairly, but also empowerment strategies. Um, organizations in Queens who registered voters fought to get people citizenship, day they get citizenship, sign them up, bingo, John Lou, right? It, it shows. Uh, people are finding ways to improve their situation. I don't think that this inequality can last forever. And at some point, we will develop a politic. And whether the existing political parties, the existing unions are going to lead that fight, that I'm not so sure about. I think there's more yeah. basic change coming. Once, yes, once these, these more uh, closely community organized organizations thrive, do you think they'll change into a union form? I don't know. Well, here's what happened. It's interesting, you know, there are groups in the city, we just did a whole book about it mm -hmm. with Ruth Milgram yes. and myself that's Great. published by Cornell coming out next month called New Labor in New York. And the, a lot of these groups started out community-based organizations trying to just deal with the problems that, that low-wage workers, poor mm -hmm. people have in a city like New York and find themselves being pulled to the workplace, that a lot of the problems that people had originate in the workplace. Job. Not only not getting paid or being in a dead-end job, but uh, the everyday substandard wages, no benefits, conditions, affect everybody's family life, affect your ability to pay your rent. So a lot of these organizations got drawn into workplace issues, and now the, the labor unions were outside of that, and now we're beginning to see a conversation taking place. You know, when I was at the Central Labor Council, my conversations were with the domestic workers and the taxi workers. I consider it the best work I ever did in my mm -hmm. life. It fundamentally changed made, what I amazing. thought about working class organizations right. should be. And I think now other people have learned from the struggles of immigrants. They've been poor for a long time. African American workers that came out of the South, they developed their own strategies in the civil rights movement mm -hmm. to improve their condition, including get that vote. Mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of disempowerment right now. And I think as we, and we have to promote this. We have to encourage people to get in the democratic process, take responsibility for the people that they choose to put into office, and make that fight. And at the workplace, young workers in particular have to learn to stand up for themselves. I was, it was a chilling thing to read the story in the Times recently about Wisconsin and what happened to the public, the union there, because as they, they lost their collective bargaining rights, people said, well, why should I bother to pay? any dues to the union. Right, and listen, people are not going to pay money for a service that doesn't exist or an organization that can't do what it's set out to do. But let's look at Wisconsin as an example because it, it, it could happen anywhere. Yeah. You basically spend 40 years in the private sector exporting jobs, contracting out, reorganizing work, crushing wages. At some point, the public sector workers are the target. Oh, oh 
you, you, that 725 an hour worker, you can't afford to pay for their pension. And people bought it. Absolutely. Right? So the, the real danger is here, is, and if you look at the city of New York, I say this to public sector workers everywhere I speak. Just because you have a union, you have a pension, and you have benefits, don't think that what's in front of your face today always existed or always will. You have a bullseye right here. You're now the target. Because Absolutely. as they've taken care of everybody else, you're the most expensive worker in the society. It's not going to work for you. So, but there, look, there's groups like the freelancers in New York. That's great. Who are imaginative, are looking at what the economy is really structured as and saying, well, if 20% of people have work but not jobs in the traditional sense, what kind of organizations do they need and what kind of policies should we be pushing for? So they advocate about how the um, unincorporated business tax impacts on their constituency. And they make struggles around it. Our people need health care. They start their own insurance company mm -hmm. in the finest traditions of American labor, in the finest traditions. It was Hillman and the clothing workers that did the amalgamated bank because they mm -hmm. understood that what? we have to have our own institutions that will sustain the movement. And we'll get there, but it's not going to happen quick. And we're going to face it now with, with the um, negotiation of all the new contracts. And with the budgets being adopted, because it's always the pension that gets the target. I mean, it always is. It's an expense item, uh, although we have done and they're incredible changes in New York to reduce yeah. you know, the current impact. Yeah. It's been at the unity of the pension system. We have six tiers. Uh, we have struggled. I think in the end, we have to rethink nationally. Uh, well, we're going to have to anyway, afterward. aren't we going to do it with Social Security? Right. Well, th what they're <laughs> thinking of, we're not interested in, right. Uh, right? But I do think we need a portable pension. If you're not going to have a job for life right. anymore, you, you have to have something that you can take with you. But you're also living longer. So you're going to have to pay longer, and you also want to create the jobs for the younger people who would fill your jobs if you retired. And well, those are the kind of changes that I think those who are institutionally are bound find yeah. hard to make. Yeah. You know, it's hard, for, it's hard for some people to go back to their constituents and say, whether it's in a union or in an elected arena, you know, you're really going to have to pay into Social Security a little bit longer in order to have a benefit. Uh, we're all living longer now. This it makes was, such sense, and I know if we say that in our circles, <laughs> the roof falls down on you. Well, at some point we have to grow up ourselves but and decide we don't <laughs> care what people think about us. That's true, too. <laughs> but I, you, you're right. I mean, 55 and, and 62 and all this is young. Well, my f <laughs> the, the weirdest thing for me was in my family, no male had made it past 62. My mother died at 62, right? So I, here I am at a certain age, over 62, and I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here. Mm. By the time I was, when I was a kid, guys my age were old men. Oh, definitely. And I don't see myself that way. I'm yeah. still a 17 year old. Well, I'm an old woman and I don't see myself that way. So yeah. I, what can I tell you? I mean, but it is. But there are new realities that we're yes, going to have to structure have to. our institutions around these new realities. So how are we going to do that? Are we going to educate younger people who are interested in uh, working with working people and union? Well, some of it's done in that. Some of these you, groups you've, you've crushed find. so much in the private sector that we can. Uh, the new movement is going to have to redo it, and they have to do it on new realities. Uh, you talked about the city contracts. If if I were becoming mayor, God forbid. Uh, <laughs> but if I were becoming mayor, I, I would want two scenarios. The optimum scenario would be that the contracts all negotiated, and I don't have to deal with them for five or six years. The second one is nobody has a contract. And if we have any decent ideas of how we want to do this better, this is the perfect opportunity to get it done. Mm. And I think that, you know, this mayor brings a lot of knowledge with him. He's been in public life a long time. He knows the city. He knows the unions and the municipal sector well. Hopefully, th between the unions and the mayor and some smart people that are around the mayor, that there's a chance here to begin to lay out a program over a period of time that's fair to the employees of the city, uh, and fair to the taxpayers of the city. But you know, that's the perennial problem in politics, mm -hmm. is that anything that goes beyond your term, you'd rather leave it to the next person. You find that in planning and everything. And that's one of our problems, isn't it? It's part of our problem. Although, you know, you could agree or disagree with a lot of what uh, Mayor Bloomberg did. But he did sit down at one point early in his administration and say, what should this city look like in 2025? Mm -hmm. And what are we going to put in to get it done, whether that was a million trees or a, a bunch of other things? 
I liked that. Mm -hmm. I thought that was valuable to the city. And hopefully this mayor will sit down at some point. He's a much younger man than I am. And he will say, what's this city going to look like in 40 years down? How does the New York City maintain itself as a capital city of the world? And what are the things that we need? Our, our infrastructure is horrible. Our subway system is 19th century, now not even pay 20th for it. century. Where's the money coming it's from? It's going to come from the pension. I mean, people are going to point to that. That the whole the the countrywide movement to opposing the public unions, the public service unions, is so outrageous. I mean, you said it before. Right. We're going to go to them first, and uh, it's, it, it, well, and there's a limit. It's not even sound economics. That's, that's the other part of it. That's the real point. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, the, and you know this from your time at the council, the, the, the solutions to the budget processes are not in the budget process. It's in the economy. It's in the private sector economy. And I think whoever is mayor of this city, who's ever running the city council, we have to find ways to make the city inviting for people to invest in. I, you know, we have alternatives and people are trying to do co-ops and everything else. But in the end, uh, it's going to be those people that are willing to come to this city, start a business, employ other workers, uh, and drive this city forward in the 21st century, or we'll stagnate. You know, Amsterdam used to be the world capital of finance at one point mm -hmm. in, in the world history. It's not anymore, and for damn good reasons. Uh, we have to really think about that. You know, the last master plan, just of planning, was done during the Lindsay administration. There hasn't been a master plan of the city since. Ooh, that hurts. It was <laughs> the first <laughs> mayoral campaign I ever volunteered on was, was Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah. Well, he he was. Uh, I think he's been very unfairly treated in history. I do too. Yeah. I do too. I, I mean, for nothing else, he was also a very decent guy. And, yeah, he uh, was. Yeah. Was, so it was an interesting time. Barney Frank that said he's giving good intentions a bad name. Oh. That's a mean thing, That's to, a mean say. thing to say. Yeah. So, are you hopeful that we're going to make this transition? Yes. I, I mean, I. I I try not to be optimistic because that leads you to take, make mistakes and, and skip details. But I do believe that, and, and I, partially because of the case studies that the students at the Graduate Center worked on that resulted in this book, you, you begin to get a real sense that people of this city, the, the poorest people of this city, have figured out things that they need to do in order so that their kids have it better. And, you know, this has been a city of immigrants, a country of immigrants. And, Every other generation has figured that out, and I honestly believe that they will figure that out. Will they create the same exact kinds of institutions we have? No. Will some of the institutions I've been associated with in my lifetime, will they lead this moment? Some will. Some will fall to the wayside if they don't deal with new realities. Do you have um, in some of the groups in New York? Did you do Make the Road by Walking? Uh, Make the Road uh, is in there. Uh, now Rock, and Rock New York is in there. The Taxi Workers Alliance is in the there. Hay, they're the, wonderful. I, and the Freelancers Union yeah, is in there. That's terrific. That is a, extremely important. I'm very thing. proud to say that I've had them all on this program. I, I'm sure you have. <laughs> I'm sure you and, have. And Mira Raccoon out in Queens is out there, yeah. who's been a civic empowerment organization in this city for two and a half decades plus. I haven't had it. I have to do that. And nobody knew who they were. Right, I have to get to them. They're terrific. Andrew Friedman, who was Make the Road, is now doing that nationally. Yes, he is doing that. He, that's a great New Yorker. Who, yeah. Uh, he just does wonderful things. But So I, all of these different things you think are eventually going to... This is the new labor movement. You know, there's... Uh, the other thing I'm very encouraged about, and the, I give some credit to the folks in Washington at the AFL-CIO and Change to Win, uh, they have developed over a period of the last decade or so real collaborations with some of these new organizations. Taxi workers are now on the executive council of the AFL-CIO. Is that right? Yes. Uh, Verve Desai is there. Oh, she's so very fabulous. Um, <laughs> and the domestic workers have their own collaborations all across uh -huh. the country. Uh, I think it's really important. Uh, yeah. The laborers union with uh, the National Day Laborers Organization. So the, will the membership follow the leadership? Will the membership follow the leadership? You know, it's funny. i got to tell you, at the base, and I think we see this in a lot of issues. You see this in gay marriage. Uh, Ramirez from the Bronx, when he was the, the county leader up there, he said to me one day, he said, you know, the problem isn't the people. The problem is the leaders. Of we course. have a hard, and he said, we, we have a hard time uh, leading, <laughs> leading the change. Uh, and he was a very smart guy, and, and he, he got it. Uh, but, yes, I think that right now, there is a desire in the world to be at peace with each other, 
Uh, there's no dominant group in the city. As far as I'm concerned, politics have never been better. If you can't do cooperative co coalition politics, you can't get anything done. So what about the real estate industry? Where do we put that? I think you put the real estate industry where it belongs, under constant scrutiny. <laughs> but um, It's not part of the coalition. They, look, and this is a problem going back to the American Revolution in this city, right? Land is extraordinarily valuable. The, the rest of the business community has to talk to the real estate industry. It's about the competitiveness of this city going forward. If this city doesn't have a working and a working middle class that can afford to be in this city, we will be increasingly inefficient. And small businesses. And if we are inefficient, other cities will pass us by. Yeah. And it just can't be the, the poor tenant leading this fight. Mm -hmm. The business community's got to stand up for itself, including the, all the commercial folks who are suffering with extraordinary rents, and say, we want from the real estate a plan that's good for everybody in the mm -hmm. city, not just good for you. Uh, landlords traditionally have been a problem. Terrible, a really incredible problem. Incredible problem. Um, the sick leave, the minimum wage, um, it's all very encouraging, that part of it, right? Those I think it's all part of this energy at the paid base. Leave. The women's yes. movement's been actually driving paid sick days yeah. in a way that the unions could. Now, just a quick example. President Obama gets elected. The first bill that passes that has a wage impact is the wage. Ledbetter bill yeah. on wage discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. The bill that doesn't pass is the Employee Free Choice Act, which the unions have been pushing. Yeah. Maybe a collaboration there in the unions with the women's movement might have had a better outcome. Yeah. Like I said, if you're not willing to do coalition politics at this point, you can't get anything done. This town, the unions are powerful. Um, but we're the, pretty much the exception across the country. And even here, uh, it's not like in the old days where, you know, a labor leader picked up the phone, the mayor took the call, the problem was solved. Uh, it's more complicated now. We're fortunate we still have a body politic well, the leadership that is, listens. Right. I mean, the leadership is not like the leadership in the old days, is it? Some places it is, and some As places. As Casey Stengel say, they're the same but different. You know, on average, they're more educated. Mm -hmm. uh, they're less rooted in an old industrial working class, which was very combative. I mean, if you look at Manhattan, right, the, the west side of Manhattan, it's it's a park. Those were working piers when yeah, I was a kid, that. and then a rotted out, abandoned yeah, industrial still, right, setting. Right. Uh, we've answered the question in the past with bad public policy. Uh, you were talking with Gail Brewer earlier, I was watching from the other room, and one of the things you were talking about is how Manhattan's gotten wealthier. Well, we look, we lost the docks, the warehouses, we lost the printing industry, we lost the garment industry. Lower East Side, we Lower lost East Side, the spice stores. industry, you used to stand at, at, at Broom and Grand and you mm -hmm. could smell the spice. Mm -hmm. It's all gone. It's, it, the whole situation was changed, and some of that was world market forces, and some of that was bad public policy. Really bad, yes. Right. Um, I was just going to think, I lost what I was going to ask you. Um, <laughs> the, um, well, if you were mayor, it seems to me you should be mayor, listening to you, uh, we would pay more attention on long-range planning and policy. Well, I, we I, would I, be, right. and you would stand, because, do you think it's because you'd have such strong credentials in the field where you also will be making some changes? I think if you're mayor, you you put together an administration to deal with the immediate problems and you want every agency to be well managed. You want a cooperative relationship with your legislative body uh, and but I think the job of the mayor in the end is to lead the city forward. Uh, you, you, you do what you have to do to maintain the city here but the real issue is how do you set the city Move up it. for when you're gone? Mm. And I, I think it's important to have the kinds of discussions that were had in that first term of Mayor mm. Bloomberg, where you took people from all over the city. You know, the attempt in the 2025 plan, Plan NYC, to get parks within 10 minutes of wherever you lived, of everybody mm. in the city, didn't come from a, a city planner with a, a degree from the University of Pennsylvania. You know, it came from people. Uh, in the environmental justice community who were invited into the room and they're the ones who said you know if you would reopen some of the schoolyards you, you could make that a reality they live on the streets of this city and knew that some of the infrastructure to accomplish that was there uh, so if the mayor's inclusive 
this notion of equity in the city, which I like that he's talking about. Yes, we're going to build very high, but there has to be equity in there. It was Michael Spillane many years ago in a meeting on affordable housing who pulled my coat when I was the political director of Central Labor Council and said, you know, in this so-called affordable stuff where they're doing 80-20, they take the tenants, the 20% affordable, and they segregate them in those buildings. <laughs> and it's demeaning. And they're still doing it. And I never forgot that. Yeah. It, yeah. I never forgot that. It's, it, so it's important to listen to the people on right. the ground. And it's important. We, we haven't paid attention, and we're almost at the end of the program, to politics. I mean, you, you, you may say it's not the answer, but you still want to have tried it at least, don't you? Well, politics is my elections. drug of choice. Right, so, right. But so, and, the, and the national unions are really participating, aren't they, in the elections, hopefully, but it's yes. going to be very difficult. Well, it's going to be very difficult. You've got a lot of gerrymandered states. Yeah, where, where the Republic, where the... Um, I think if we just do an accounting of the seats, which we have to do, mm -hmm. uh, it's inadequate to the task. The mm -hmm. question is, can we do what the right wing did starting in the late 50s, where they set out and said, we don't like the body politic, we don't like the court system. They spent 50 years getting the courts they want. I think for the progressive side of the agenda, uh, we're going to have to set out our goals and really work for them, and we have to toughen up uh, if we want to get back to the kind of society that we proclaim is possible to live in, uh, and it's not going to be easy. It's a, a long term. I just um, would like you to come back because I would like to continue this discussion. One of the things I'm interested in is that we're so far behind so many other nations, and we don't understand that. People don't know that as far as social policy. Uh, well, look, I, we do a very good job in this country of convincing everybody we're, we're number one. We're the greatest. One. We're yeah. number one. What we're number one, it seems to be, in the, in the industrialized nations is manufacturing poverty. We're creating exactly. more people faster than anybody else, and I, I think we, that's all about this shift of income to the top and this disempowerment at, at the bottom. You know, they don't attack immigrants because they don't like immigrants. They attack immigrants because it works. They don't want to empower people. They're interested in keeping their own power. And right. we have to talk about it. I didn't see this book before. I'm going to read this book, and you're going to come back. Thank you very much, Ed Ott. Very nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.